Hi, my name is Pip. I'm an author. I've written two books. My books are YA fantasy books and they're called The Hunted and A Night Rises and they're the first two books in the Phoenix series. And for a long time now I've wanted to make a video about the wands that the witches and wizards in the books have and the significance of the ingredients they use to create their own wands. The idea of being able to choose what elements you want in your own wand, including the base wood that the wand is made of, was an idea that came really early when I first thought of the Phoenix series and it's something that I really love because I would love to be able to do this. I would love to go out there and consider what elements I want and put them in a wand and have that enhance my powers or my spell casting ability if I had magic. When the idea for the Phoenix series first came to me, this was the booklet that was beside me. And so it has a lot of early scribbles like wand ingredients and what each ingredient could signify or what kind of spell it could enhance. So for example, uh, having a powerful emerald in your wand could enhance your ability to cast healing spells. It's also where I started dabbling with names and um, plot structure, although the plot structure in here has changed really a lot. But there's also a lot of stuff in here like that I don't remember at all. But there is actually some stuff, in, like quite a bit of stuff that is consistent um, with what exists in the Phoenix series today. But this is the little book that started it all. I wanted the way the ones are created and formed to be something that is kind of done based on instinct by younger witches and wizards. You can buy basic wands in the hive at Wanda's Wands and they will work for you, but they won't understand you in the same way a wand of your creation will. The way to think about it, and I think it's the Ophelia Academy of Magic's principle that actually brings this up is it is like an extension of your nervous system. So if you've created it and you've done that based on instinct and you have picked ingredients that are unique and specific to you and you've created a very unique wand and cast a particular spell when creating that wand, then it'll work only for you. Nobody else can use it, even if they find it, even if they disarm you. And your ability to cast and your power of casting is magnified significantly by casting with a wand of your creation versus one you just bought down at the shops. I spent a really long time looking into a whole range of natural products like different types of woods to be the bases for the wands. Things like thistles and honey and other ingredients that in those cases could be potentially uh, assisting with healing spells or medicine spells of some variety and I did spend quite a bit of time going through this and making a huge list of things that extended you know back to ancient Egypt or were more recent and more modern. So there is meaning and a lot of property consideration for each item that was placed in the cauldron in the potion when these young witches and wizards were making their wands. There's also a lot of Easter eggs and nods to things from my life. So perfect example of this would be William's wand. It is made of white gum, but it has a very silvery appearance. And so it is often referred to as a silver gum wand because the silver is the color and the gum is the type of wood, as opposed to it being a silver gum tree wood, um, which I know is confusing, but it is what it is. And I didn't want to have to explain it every single time I referred to his wand. But I love white gums. White gums are my jam. They are everywhere in Australia. And when you get a huge planting of them, and particularly in winter or like a really foggy day, they're so beautiful, but they're really eerie and very, very silver in color. When they're in, you know, bright summer sun, not so much, but in winter, they really have this very eerie silver vibe. And you know, like that, my love of that nods back to things like the Silver Brumby as a kid and that sort of fascination with a white horse disappearing into the woods, which again is a nod to something in the book. William is a shapeshifter and he is able to shift into his wolf form because he is part werewolf and he is also able to shift into a brilliant white stallion. And that 
is very much a nod to my childhood and the silver brumby. Aurora's wand is made of hewn pine, which is a very Australian piece of wood. It's from Tasmania. It is very slow growing. It is very golden and yellow, and it, ha it comes with these beautiful kind of caramel colored age rings through it. So again, a nod to my heritage. I also just wrote a sassafras wand in the other day, which is Again, a type of wood you find in Tasmania, and it is my personal favorite. So if the first wand we look at is William's wand, which I have already said is a silvery white gum wand. White gum being the type of wood, silver being the color, so sometimes it does get referred to as a silver gum wand, uh, because gum is the type of wood of his wand. One of the things we learn throughout the Phoenix series is about the power behind emeralds and how important they are when you're casting healing spells. They make your healing spells so much more powerful and so much more effectual. And that is not something that William knows when he's creating his wand. He comes to the Ophelia Academy of Magic without really knowing anything at all. He gets sent to the Academy with a silver colored white gum box because once you cut white gum, it does start to go silvery as it dries out. Um, as well as the fact that they look silvery in a forest en masse. But his mother and father created this white gum box for him and they put all these different things in there and he was sent off to the academy with a letter from his father saying that everything that he needed would be in this box. And so he went through that box and used parts of the box to create the base wood for his wand. And some of the things that were in that box were added in as the ingredients of his wand. One of those things being a emerald and diamond ring. Now what he doesn't know at the time is that his mother is the high priestess, the Orphelia, and he is the Orphea. And they have been living in hiding and she has been protecting him and sheltering him and hiding the truth of who he is and hiding the truth of the magical world from him. And so he doesn't realize that when he's putting that uh, diamond and emerald ring in the potion to create his wand, that he's actually putting in a ring that has significant power because it was gifted to his mother, the high priestess, by the tree of life. In his white gum box, he also has two vials of blood. One is his mother's blood, one is his father's blood. And I'm not going to say too much about this because it is really important as the series travels on and two books are published at the moment. The third one will be out soon and I just don't want to potentially ruin this because I know that more likely people are going to watch this video down the track when they've just recently discovered the series. So I'm going to try and keep this relatively spoiler free but just know that things like blood are very important in the Phoenix series. Uh, blood magic is a really, really powerful kind of magic. Your personal possessions and your powers are in your blood and that is something that can be taken. So when William puts his parents' blood in his wand, he is, without knowing it, casting blood magic and creating a really powerful um, kind of combination of protection and extreme power because his mother is a high priestess with gifts people haven't seen before and his father is a werewolf and he's extremely protective, laid down his life for his son so he's kind of bringing in these elements of protection and and his mother's powers into his wand. He also has Indian Cobra Venom in his wand. Like many types of venom, Indian Cobra Venom has the ability to create respiratory suppression and cardiac arrest and it's very toxic. In his white gum box, he also finds a white feather and he puts that in not really knowing the significance of that or what kind of bird it came from. What we discover through The Hunted is that he is the Ophir and that is not a spoiler for people if they haven't read it. And his mother has a perfect white eagle, an albino eagle. And that is one of the feathers of the albino eagle. And I'm just going to leave it there and you guys can read to find out why that's important. Water from the fountain of the Ophelia is something else that William has in his wand. This is a very significant uh, fountain. It has properties that it gives to people who are in essence special and called to the fountain. Something we find out in book two of the Phoenix series, A Night Rises, is that 
using the fountain water is something that's common in the wands of the knights of ophelia and it allows them to call the ophelia so she could be anywhere in the world in hiding and they can call her using the properties in the water from the fountain of ophelia which can be found at the ophelia academy of magic william of course is called to that fountain and takes a sample of that water he is guided to do so by ewan ewan is a very important character but we're not talking about characters today we're talking about wands the other thing that's important about this fountain water is it actually has really good healing properties for more minor injuries. So if you suffer a devastating injury, it's not gonna stitch your insides back together, but it is gonna help with those more minor injuries and wound cleaning and infection control and things like that. So there are hidden properties and things around the castle and around uh, the magical island of Lanhyvalia that people learn about as we go through the series and Sometimes you're just called to these things by instinct and you learn about them through trial and error. Penelope Elderson is our other point of view character and she has a pink ivory wood base, which is an extremely rare, strong type of wood. In her wand, she puts an eagle wind and a jeweled eye of Horus. This is about protection, royal power, and good health. The lotus flower, which is also a symbol of beauty, grace, and even rebirth in ancient Egyptian culture, is also something that Penelope places in her potion that she creates her wand from. In one of the books, she learns how to call forth the ingredients from her wand. Now, when she does this, she's able to take a lotus petal, for example, from her wand, and use that to create a potion for whatever task it is that she is doing at the time. Now she can do that and use the ingredients that are in her wand and have those available to her without actually taking them out of her wand. So essentially it allows you to receive gifts from your wand and from the properties within your wand without draining the properties from the wand. So this means if you've really thought about what you're going to put in your wand, it might be super helpful down the track. Penelope is able to cast fire from her body. So one of the things she does is cast some fire into the potion that creates her wand. Now this basically has the effect of uh, magnifying her power and capturing her power within her wand. She's also in effect strengthening the wand with her own magical gifts. I was thinking about reading through the chapter that um, they do their one creation with so that you guys could listen to that But I think this video will get way too long if I do that. So I'll just focus on the main uh, group of friends the main characters and We can maybe do another video about ones later if there's something specific you want to know Or if you would like that chapter read then absolutely let me know below in the comments but now we're going to keep talking about what's in everybody's wands and we're now going to talk about Michael Humphreys. Michael's wand is made of ebony which is a brown or black hardwood and it is a very very dense wood and it can be shined up and I've only ever seen ebony shined up so I still even now feel like the internet is lying to me and that ebony is not actually a type of wood but apparently it is. So. There you go, you learn something new every day. It has a real hardness and durability to it and apparently it was used in scepters of kings in India back in the day. They have a cauldron and it is filled with a particular type of potion and they put their ingredients in there and it kind of melts them down and combines them. It's about trying to find compatible items that will meld well together so that um, you end up with a powerful wand and then they cast a spell on the cauldron and there's their wand. So Michael actually puts a blue cat eyeball into that potion. A quirk of the House of Humphreys, including those who marry into the House of Humphreys, is that they all have at least one blue eye. Michael has a blue eye and a hazel eye and he made sure that the cat eyeball that he put in his wand was blue. So that is a nod to his family heritage and the House of Humphreys quirk, but cat eyes are also significant. Cat eyes can be a symbol of wisdom or truth or even psychic abilities, so you'll have to read the books to find out how this affects Michael. One of the last ingredients Michael puts in his wand is spider web, and I think we all know how strong spider's webs are. Penelope's twin brother Nathaniel also created his wand at the same time she did, and his base wand is made of ebony. 
He also added magma, mercury, dry ice, puffin eggs, baleen or whalebone, and shark fin. And if you look at this wand and this wizard, he is actually quite dark in his characteristics and his mood and his personality. And that is something that magnifies over time and becomes a really significant part of who Nathaniel is, what his character arc is, and the storylines that revolve around him. Aurora's wand is made of hewn pine, and hewn pine is a type of tree that comes from Tasmania and it has these beautiful caramel age rings in the center of it and it's quite a bright yellow wood. I actually have like a slab of this uh, type of wood at home and that influenced my choice for Aurora. I also picked it for her because she's bright, she's a little bit unusual and she has spent a bit of time in Australia with her parents. Her mother is a healer and she has spent time in Australia learning about the different kinds of natural magic here and learning about the healing methods that the indigenous community have been using for thousands and thousands of years. Their theory being that even if it's magic that you can't possess yourself because you don't have, say, the magic of the indigenous people, that you can still learn something from it, you can be inspired by a different way of thinking and use that to grow as a person and therefore her mother hopes to become a better healer. And so that fact that they've spent a little bit of time in Australia influences Aurora but it also more influences her younger brother Ewan. The rings of age in the Hewan Pine also indicate wisdom. One of her most special ingredients is a dragon's tooth and this perhaps has something to do with how Aurora ends up having a dragon with her and having an unusual amount of control over that dragon. She has a mirror for reflection and a scarab beetle which is related to resurrection in her wand and these are some really strong and powerful ingredients to have in your wand. She also put a sprinkling of moon dust in her brew for her wand and that allows her to create a blinding light and that is really useful when she's calling her dragon. Trixabel Avery has been raised with the elves in Havenfield. She is part elf, part human and being raised elf means that she has a real focus on the magic that's available to us from nature and harnessing the powers of mother nature to magnify your own magic. And this really influences the choices she makes for what she's going to put in her wand. At the time she creates her wand, she's quite naive and very playful. She really doesn't know much about the actual magical community because she's been raised amongst the elves. So this naive but playful nature that we see in Trixabel early on in the Phoenix series is something that she kind of grows out of quite quickly because they go through a lot in this story and in these books and Trixabel kind of becomes much more focused and elf-like and and really um, becomes quite a warrior, quite a strong woman and very very instinct driven. So her wand is quite an interesting one because it really represents her um, sort of childhood innocence and that bolsters her and strengthens her as a more refined, focused and controlled adult. As we've already said emeralds are related to healing, they're also related to luck. She also puts penicillin in her wand ingredients and this is a very powerful combination because she wants to be a healer and because she's learnt the ways of the elves, if she can then add the ways of magic to um, her skill set, she's going to become a really powerful healer. She's got willow bark and leaves and honey in her wand. And she also puts in soil because she believes that we all come from the earth and we all return to the earth. And so sometimes the little things that they put into their wands are not necessarily there to harness a particular property from that item or to harness something magic from a sacred element but sometimes more to reflect their personal beliefs and I think that's the case with the soil but you know mother earth she's a powerful being so perhaps it magnifies Trixabel's 
skills and powers somewhat. Trixie Bell does manage to put a fair amount into her wand ingredients and one of the things is a jar of lightning and she doesn't realize this at the time but she is gifted with lightning naturally so she is able to call it forth from her body so putting it in her wand is a little bit like penelope putting her own personal fire in her wand it does magnify her strength it does complement her personal powers and it's just a really strong element to have in your wand. She's got the finger of a green goblin in there which is for speed, agility and healing. Leaves of a Californian laurel and finally a bouncy ball. So this does mean her wand has a little bit of bounce to it. Finally we get to one of my favorite side characters, Miles Haas. Miles has an ironwood base for his wand and Ironwood is an incredibly strong type of wood. Strength under pressure is actually what comes up when you Google the properties of ironwood and that fits Miles to a T. He's got some candle wax in there, some opium, and even a sea snake that he has to wrestle into his cauldron. Miles is one of those people who really doesn't know his own strength, but he's so filled with kindness and humor and loyalty that it's really hard not to love him. And I think you're gonna find his character arc and his pathway through the Phoenix series quite interesting. I hope you've enjoyed this video and this insight into wand creation and the relevance of the wands in the Phoenix series. If you have, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to my channel if you would like to check out the books of the Phoenix series. The Hunted and A Night Rises are available in ebook and paperback everywhere that books are sold and you can check me out on Instagram and Twitter at Pip Coombs. Thank you for watching. Do, 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 do. Check out my wand. It's a stick. Found it outside.